Hi, Terry Shaneyfell for UAB School of Medicine. In part one of this two-part series on how to critically appraise a systematic review, we're going to look to see that the authors found all the studies available to answer the question that they had for their review. We also want to make sure that they used unbiased inclusion criteria when deciding which articles to keep and which to reject for the review. So critically appraising a systematic review requires three steps. One, to determine if the results are valid, two, to determine what the results are, and three, to determine if the results will help you care for your patient. In this video, we're going to focus on determining if the results are valid. So first off, we're going to focus only on systematic reviews during this video. You really can't critically appraise narrative reviews because they have no method section. It's always best to assume they're just a biased collection of articles that support the author's point of view. Might not be totally correct, but you really can't tell because there is no method section. A very important point is to remember that reviews are only as good as the studies upon which they're based. If the primary studies are flawed, I can't fix those flaws by doing a systematic review. So key point to remember, reviews are only as good as the studies upon which they're based. And these are the four questions we'll need to answer as we critically appraise a systematic review to determine if it's valid. And we'll go through each one of these individually. I'm going to demonstrate how to critically appraise a systematic review by critically appraising this review published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2011. It was a background review for a clinical practice guideline on venous thromboembolism, prophylaxis, and hospitalized patients. And a nice thing the Annals has done is has very structured abstracts of their systematic reviews. You can gain a lot of information um, looking at one of these reviews. So first question is, was the search for the relevant primary studies to include in the review detailed and exhaustive? Remember, the whole point of a systematic review is that we want to try to understand the totality of the evidence on a given topic. So to do that, the authors need to find the totality of the evidence. And it can be both published and unpublished. So it's very easy to find the published information. The key is finding the unpublished information. So the authors need to do a very multifaceted search. They need to look in a lot of places. And these are some of the places they can look. So it's very common that they'll do electronic database searches like Medline and its European component Embase. Um, it's common that they'll do manual searches of the reference list of retrieved articles from this above search and other review articles. But we'd like them to do more. We'd like them to contact experts and see if they know of any studies that they've done that they've not published. They could look in funding agencies to see if there are any studies funded that haven't been published. Trial registries, it's very common nowadays for randomized controlled trials to be registered, and you can search through those to see if any studies have been done on the topic of interest. They should look at meaning abstracts, theses, and importantly, not only limit the search to the English language, which is often what happens, but they also look in non-English resources. And one of the reasons authors don't look in non-English sources is because you have to back translate them into English. Um, and sometimes this can be a little bit tricky and obviously time consuming. Key is you want them to do as much as possible to find everything that's out there, both published and unpublished on a topic. At a bare minimum, they need to do an electronic database search and a manual search of, of reference lists and other review articles. Anything less than this is unacceptable. So this gets to a concept of publication bias. This is a topic unto itself. So I've made a separate video describing what publication bias, bias is, and I invite you to look at that. So let's see how our annals review did. So here's a um, little bit of the article I've shown here. I'd like you to pause the video, see how well these authors did at finding as much information as possible about thromboembolism prophylaxis. When you're done looking through this, restart the video and see how I answer. So what do you think? Did they do a good job? Well, they did a fairly good multifaceted search. They searched an electronic database in Medline. They searched a, a trial registry. They looked at reference lists of articles that they retrieved and reviews, and they did contact original authors. So that's not a bad job. But in the discussion section, they did find evidence of some publication bias. So they might have missed uh, some studies. And clearly, they could have done more. But I think they did a fairly good job of finding as much as they could probably find. Number two is, were the criteria used to select the studies for inclusion in the review appropriate? And what appropriate means is unbiased. We don't want authors selecting studies that support their point of view. They need to let the data develop their point of view. So common things that are used as inclusion criteria shown here. Remember, systematic reviews are trying to answer a very specific question. And specific questions will have a specific patient population, intervention, and outcomes 
that need to be answered. So these things make sense. But often authors also use methodological criteria like they want to limit their review to randomized control trials. So sometimes they'll put that in there. And the key is to look at this and see does it make clinical sense um, and will it lead to an unbiased uh, set of studies. You also like to see that more than one person decided if an article made it in or not. Because again, we don't want a biased selection of studies. So we'd like more than one person to independently look at each individual study and decide if it meets the inclusion criteria. We also would like it to be blinded so that the authors don't influence each other in deciding if something should be included or not. We like them to have very specific reasons and specify those reasons for rejecting a study. We won't, don't want it that they reject a study just because it doesn't fit their point of view. And again, the goal here is to have an unbiased selection of all the data um, that meets the inclusion criteria on a topic. So let's see how our annals review did. So here's some information I'd like you to read. Pause the video, see how, how you think these authors did, restart to see um, how I answer it. So what did you think? How did they do? Well, they had a um, methodologic criteria of randomization, and they limited it to English language. I'd like to have seen them have a little bit broader um, search to non-English language. Um, they limited things to treatments commonly used and recommended to prevent venous thromboembolism. That makes sense. Uh, they had a variety of um, comparators that they looked at. To me, these clinically make sense. Um, they looked at patients separately, whether they were hospitalized or if they had a stroke. To me, this clinically makes sense. And then they give you some reasons for excluding a variety of articles. So I think this was reasonable inclusion criteria. I don't think it would have led to a biased sampling of studies. And what you often see and what these authors did is you often see these sort of flow charts. And you can look over here to see how many articles they initially found and how many they excluded. And then you can go through and should go through and see why did they exclude these articles. Does this make sense? And again, you're trying to make sure there's not a biased sampling of studies um, to support the author's point of view. And I think you can see lots of studies were looked at to find a few studies that were ultimately included. And this is just how it goes in systematic reviews. A lot of studies get rejected for a variety of reasons. Just look through the reasons, make sure they make sense. So this concludes part one of how to critically appraise a systematic review. I invite you to move on to part two to see um, the last two questions that we have to answer as we read a systematic review.